Hello, and welcome back to a dramatic reading of Stephen King's The Eyes of the Dragon. Get out of here, bookmark. This is our last recording session. As you can see, there's only a few pages left on the book. So for all of you who've stuck with me for months, it's taken a couple of months to record this, and there's been over 30 video sessions as I stole time with my full-time job. We've got young kids at home I've, they are my main motivation for recording this but i tell you it was the unexpected sub subscribers and commenters i'm like who honestly is going to sit through my poorly uh, voiced uh, uh poor, unedited uh re reading of this but it really has gone the way that i felt it was these books were first read to me which was just by some normal person somebody around my age probably uh, when I was in grade school and the, the, the books captured my imagination just because somebody took some time to read with me a little bit each week as they did with all my classmates. And I never forgot these books. I hope you purchase a copy by the end of um, the time that you're done listening here just to support the great Stephen King, who obviously wrote the book. Um, and just your comments, your subscribing and stuff like that helps support me, the, the amateur uh, voice actor. So I appreciate all the feedback and stuff like that. People have asked what the next book will be. I just want to show you that before I lose you here, before you run away. Um, I've, I've really caught the bug here from, from all the support from people watching and they want me to keep reading and my kids are catching on to the videos now they're watching it. So they want me to keep going. Uh, the book I'm going to read next is the hatchet by Gary Paulson. And that's because it's a, it's a number one bestseller since it came out and was read to me when I was a kid, and it's still awesome. And I just finished re-listening to it recently on audiobook, and I was like, this is fantastic. We should definitely do this one next, and it's a short read. So forgive the little plug there as we wrap up, but I do want you to stick with us if you feel like it. Let me read to you uh, Gary Paulson's The Hatchet, okay? All right, so let's, let's, let's close it out now and get to the very end of The Eyes of the Dragon. Again, I appreciate you listening to me on that preamble. It's been a long journey. Um, so here we go. Chapter 133. Remember, we're in the midst of the climax. So Flag has a flag has made it to the top of the needle. Peter has climbed almost all the way, uh, almost like 100 feet down, and the rope has just snapped. And now Peter is flying through the air. Flag is screaming in frustration as he realizes that there's probably going to be something, uh, some way for Peter to truly escape. So the last line was that awful cry. So Flag had screamed out. He opened his mouth and screamed with rage. That awful cry woke up more people in Delane than the fall of the tower, the, the tower of the great gods, which had blown off in the storm uh, just the night before. So now we go to chapter 133, Peter falling through the air. Peter heard that twanging sound, felt the rope part. Cold wind rushed up past his face. He tried to steal himself for the crash, knowing it would come in less than a second. The pain, if he didn't die instantly, would be the worst. I mean, can you imagine that hitting cobblestones and not dying because you know, your legs kind of break your fall a little bit? Ugh, you know, that would be awful. So he's he's terrified. Cold wind rushed up past his face. He tried to steal himself for the... Oh, sorry, I just read that. And that was when Peter struck the thick, deep drift of royal napkins, which Frisky had hauled out of the castle and across the plaza in a stolen cart, the royal napkins which Ben, Dennis, and Naomi had worked so feverishly to pile up. The size of that pile, it looked like a whitewashed haystack, was never really known. Because Ben, Dennis, and Naomi all had different estimates on the subject, perhaps Peter's own idea was the best, since he was the one who fell squarely in the middle of it. He believed that messy, lovely, life-saving life pile of napkins must have been at least 20 feet high. And for all I know, he may have been right. Chapter 134. He fell squarely into the middle, as I have said, making a crater. When he fell back, when he fell over on his back and lay still. Far above, Ben heard Flag howl with rage, and he thought, You don't need to do that. Everything's going to be just fine for you, magician. He's died anyway, in spite of all we can do. So they thought Peter's dead. Then... Peter sat up. He looked dazed, but very much alive. In spite of Flag, in spite of the fact that there might be guards of the watch racing towards them of that, at that moment, Ben Stodd whooped. It was a sound of pure triumph. He grabbed Naomi and kissed her. Hurrah, Dennis cried, grinning dizzily. Hurrah for the king. Then Flag screeched again far above them. The sound of a devil bird cheated of its prey. The whooping, the kissing, and the hurrahing all stopped right then. You'll pay with your heads, Flag shrieked. 
He was insane with rage. You'll pay with your heads, all of you. Guards of the watch, to the needle, to the needle. The regicide has escaped, to the needle. Kill the murdering prince, kill his gang, kill them all. And in the castle that surrounded the plaza of the Needle, on all four sides, windows began to be lit. And from two sides came the sound of running feet and the clash of metal as swords were drawn. Kill the prince, Flag shrieked hellishly from the top of the Needle. Kill his gang, kill them all. Peter tried to get up, floundered, and fell over again. Part of his mind was crying out urgently that he must get to his feet, that they must be away, or they would be killed. But another part insisted he was already dead or severely wounded, and all of this was only a dream of his perishing mind. He seemed to have landed in a bed of the very napkins which had occupied so much of his mind over the last five years. And how could that be anything but a dream? Ben's strong hand gripped his upper arm, and he knew it was real, all happening. Peter, are you all right? Are you really all right? Not a bit hurt, Peter said. We've got to get away from here. My king, Dennis cried, falling to his knees before the dazed Peter and grinning the same dizzy, foolish grin. My oath of fealty forever. I swear my... Swear later, Peter cried, laughing in spite of himself, as Ben had pulled him to his feet. So Peter now pulled Dennis to his. Let's get out of here. Which gate, Ben asked. He knew, as Peter did himself, that Flag would already be on his way back down. They come from all sides by the sound. In truth, Ben thought any direction would do for the battle which was surely to come and result in their eventual slaughter. This is what he thinks. But, dazed or not, Peter knew perfectly well where he wanted to go. The West Gate, he said, and quickly, run! The four of them ran, frisky, at their heels. Chapter 135. Still fifty yards from the West Gate, Peter's band met a party of seven sleepy, confused guards. Most of them had sheltered from the storm in one of the warm lower kitchens of the castle, drinking mead and exclaiming to one another that they would have something to tell their grandchildren about. This is the storm. They did not know the half of what they would have to tell their grandchildren about. As it happened, their leader was a man-boy of about twenty, and only a goshawk, which we would call a corporal, I suppose. Still, he hadn't anything to drink and was reasonably alert. He was determined to do his duty. Halt in the name of the king, he called out as Peter's group closed with his slightly larger one. He tried to thunder his command, but a storyteller should tell as much of the truth as he can, and I must tell you that the goshawk's voice was more squeak than thunder. Peter was unarmed, of course, but Ben and Naomi both carried short swords, and Dennis had his rusty dagger. All three of them at once pushed in front of Peter. Ben and Naomi's hands went to their hilts. Dennis had already pulled his dagger. Stop, Peter cried. His voice was thunder. You must not draw! Shocked, surprised even, Ben threw a glance at Peter. Peter stepped to the fore. He stood with his eyes flashing moonlight and his beard riffling in the light, cha- uh, oh, in the light, chill-edged wind. He was dressed in the rough clothes of a prisoner, but his face was commanding and regal. Halt in the name of the king, you say, Peter said. He stepped calmly toward the terrified goshawk until the two of them were almost chest to chest, Less than six inches separated them. The guard fell back a step in spite of his own drawn sword and the fact that Peter's hands were empty. And I tell you, Goshawk, I am the king. The guard licked his lips. He looked around at his men. But, he began, you... What's your name? Peter asked quietly. The Goshawk gaped. He could have run Peter through in a second. But he only gaped, helplessly, like a fish drawn from water. Your name, Goshawk. My lord, I... I mean, prisoner, you... I... The young soldier fumbled once more and then said helplessly, My name is Galen. And do you know who I am? Yes, said one of the others. We know you, murderer. I did not murder my father, Peter said quietly. It was the king's magician who did that. 
He is hot behind us now, and I advise you, very strongly, I advise you to wear of him. Soon he will be troubled. Soon he will trouble Delane no more. I promise this on my father's name. But for now, you must let me pass. There was a long moment of silence. Galen held up his sword again as if to run Peter through. Peter did not flinch. He owed the gods a death. It was a death. It was a debt he had owed ever since he had come a shrieking naked baby from his mother's belly. It was a debt every man and woman, woman in creation owed. If he was to pay that debt now, let it be so. Do you hear what he's saying? So he's like, we all have to die. So he's like, if I'm, I know I have to die. I owe life one death. One death. Let it be now. But he was the rightful king, not a rebel, not a usurper, and he would not run or stand aside, or let his friends hurt this lad. The sword wavered. Then Galen let it fall until the tip of the blade touched the frozen cobbles. Let him pass, he muttered. Mayhap he murdered. Mayhap he didn't. All I know is that it's royal muck and I'll not step into it, lest I be drawn into a quicksand of kings and princes. You had a wise mother, Goshawk, Ben Stodd said grimly. Yes. Let him pass, a second voice said unexpectedly. By gods, I'll not strike my blade at such. From the look of him, I'll burn my hand off when it went in. You will be remembered, Peter said. He looked around at his friends. Follow me now, he said, and be quick. I know what I must have, and I know where to get it. At that moment, Flag burst from the base of the needle, and with such a howl of rage and fury rose in the night that the young guards quailed before it. They backed up, turned and ran, scattering to the four pegs of the compass. Come on, Peter said. Follow me, the West Gate. Chapter 136. Here we are, chapter 136. Flag ran as he had never run before. He sensed the oncoming ruin of all his plans now, at what was practically the last moment. It must not happen, and he knew as well as Peter where all this must end. He passed the cowering guards without looking around. They sighed with relief, thinking he must not have seen them. But Flag did. He saw them all and marked each. After Peter died, their heads would decorate the tower walls for a year and a day, he thought. As for the brat in charge of their patrol, he would die a thousand deaths in the dungeon first. He ran under the arch of the west gate and down the main western gallery into the castle itself. Sleepy folk who had come out in their nightclothes to see what all this row was about cowered before his whitely burning face and fell aside, forking their fist and last fingers at, at him to ward off evil. Oh, forking their first and last fingers at him to ward off evil. For now, Flag looked like what Flag really was a demon. He vaulted over the banister of the first staircase he came to. It's funny that they that the author kind of is willing to admit that. And for those of you who are Stephen King fans, know this is kind of the origin story of Flag, who has shown up in the Dark Tower series and, and many other Stephen King books, like The Stand and things like that. So Flag is this evil demon who has appeared through time and through these stories. Um, he vaulted over the banister of the first staircase he came to, landed on his feet, the iron on his heels flashed green fire like the eyes of lynxes, and ran on. On towards... Roland's apartments, where it all went down. 137. The locket, Peter panted to Dennis as they ran. Do you still have the locket I threw down? Dennis clutched at his throat and found the golden heart. Peter's own blood dried on the tip and nodded. Give it to me. Dennis passed it to him as they ran. Peter did not put the chain over his neck, but looped it in his fist so that the heart bounced and spun as he ran, flashing red gold in the light of the wall sconces. Soon, my friends, Peter panted. They turned a corner. Ahead, Peter saw the door to his father's apartments. It was here that he had last seen Roland. He had been a king, responsible for the lives and welfare of thousands. He had also been an old man, grateful for a warming glass of wine and a few minutes of talk with his son. It was here that it would end. Once upon a time, his father had slain a dragon with an arrow called Foe Hammer. Now, Peter thought, as blood pounded in his temples and his heart raced hotly in his chest, I must try to slay another dragon, a much greater one, 
with that same arrow. Chapter 138 Thomas lit the fire, donned his father's robe, and drew Roland's chair close to the hearth. He felt that he would soon fall asleep soundly, and that was very good. But as he sat there, owlishly, oops, excuse me, owlishly nodding, looking around at the trophies mounted on the walls with their glassy eyes sparkling eerily in the flames, it occurred to him that he wanted two more things, things that were almost sacred, things that he would certainly have never have dared touch when his father was alive. But Roland was dead, so Thomas had taken another chair to stand on, and from the wall he had taken down his father's bow and his father's great arrow, foe hammer, from their places on the wall above Niner's head. For a moment he stared directly into one of dra the dragon's amber-green eyes. He had seen much through those eyes, but now, looking into them, he saw nothing but his own pallid face, like the face of a prisoner looking out of a cell. Although everything in the room had been numbingly cold, the fire would warm things up at least around the fireplace, but it would take a while, he thought that the arrow was strangely warm. He vaguely remembered an old tale he had heard as a small child. According to this tale, a weapon used to slay a dragon never lost the dragon's heat. It seemed that tale was true, Thomas thought sleepily. But there was nothing scary about the arrow's heat. In fact, it seemed comforting. Thomas sat down with the bow clutched loosely in one hand and foe hammer with its strange, sleeping warmth clutched in the other, never realizing that his brother was now coming in search of this very weapon and that Flag, the author of his birth and the chief warder of his life, was hot on Peter's heels. Chapter 139 Thomas hadn't stopped to consider what he would do if the door to his father's room had been locked, and Peter never did either. In the old days, it had never been, and as things turns out, the door wasn't locked now. Peter had to do more than lift the latch. He burst in, the others hot on his heels, Frisky barking wildly, all of her fur standing on end. Frisky understood the true nature of things better, I'll warrant. Something was coming. Something with a black scent, like the poison fumes that sometimes killed the coal miners of the eastern barony when their tunnels went too deep. Frisky would fight the owner of that scent if she had to, fight and even die. But if she could have spoken, Frisky would have told them that the black scent approaching them from behind did not belong to a man. It was a monster chasing them. Some horrible it. And those of you who have read Stephen King's book, It know that uh, Stephen King knows all about that sort of nameless, deep-in-your-heart sort of fear that can chase you. Peter, what? Ben began, but Peter ignored him. He knew what he must have. He rushed across the room on his exhausted, trembling legs, looking up at the head of Niner, reached for the bow and the arrow that had always been hung above the head. Then the hand faltered. Both were gone. Dennis, the last one in, had closed the door behind him and shot the bolt. Now a single great blow fell on, the gr on that door. The stout hardwood panels, re reinforced with bands of iron, boomed. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi looked over his shoulder. I oh, wait, sorry. Peter looked over his shoulder, eyes widening. Dennis and Naomi cringed backwards. Frisky stood before her mistress, snarling. Her gray-green eyes showed the whites all around. Let me pass, Flag roared. Let me pass the door. Peter, Ben shouted and drew his sword. Stand away, Peter shouted back. If you value your lives, stand away. All of you, stand away. They scattered back just as Flag's fist, now glowing with blue flame, slammed down the door, down against the door again. Hinges, bolts, and iron bands all burst at the same time with the noise of an exploding cannon. <laughs> Blue fire spoked through the cracks between the boards and narrow rays. Then the stout planks burst apart. Shattered chunks of wood flew in a spray. The ragged remains of the door stood for a moment longer, then fell inward with a hand clap sound. Flag stood in the corridor, his hood fallen back. His face was waxen white. His lips were strips of liver drawn back to show his teeth. His eyes flared with furnace fire. In his hand, he grasped his heavy executioner's axe. 
He stood there a moment longer and then stepped inside. He looked left and saw Dennis. He looked right and saw Ben and Naomi with Frisky hunched, snarling at her feet. His eyes marked them, cataloged them for future reference, and dismissed them. He strode through the remains of the door, now looking only at Peter. You fell, but you did not die, he said. You may think your god was kind, but I tell you, my own gods were saving you for me. Pray to your god now that your heart should burst apart in your chest. Fall on your knees and pray for that, because I tell you that my death would be much worse than any you can imagine. Peter stood where he was, between Flag and his father's chair, where Thomas sat, as yet unseen by all the others. Peter met Flag's infernal gaze, unafraid. For a moment, Flag seemed to flinch under that firm gaze, and then his inhuman grin blazed forth. You and your friends have caused me great trouble, my prince, Flag whispered. Great trouble. I should have ended your miserable life long ago. But now, all troubles will end. I know you, Peter replied. Although he was unarmed, his voice was steady and unafraid. I think my father knew you too, although he was weak. Now I assume my kingship, and I command you, demon. Peter drew himself up to his full height. The flames in the fireplace reflected from his eyes, making them blaze. In that moment, Peter was every inch Delane's king. Peter drew himself up to his full height. The flames in the fireplace reflected from his eyes. Oh, wait, shoot. Now get you gone from here. Leave Delane behind, now and forever. You are cast out. Get you gone. Peter thundered this last in a voice which was greater than his own. He thundered in a voice that was many voices. All the kings and queens there had ever been in Delane, stretching back to the time when the castle had been little more than a collection of mud huts and people, and the people had drawn together in terror around their fires during the darks of winter as the wolves howled and the trolls gobbled and screamed in the great forests of yestertime. Flag seemed to flinch again, almost to cringe. Then he came forward, slowly very slowly, his huge axe swung in his left hand. You may command in the next world, he whispered. By escaping, you've played into my hands. If I'd thought of it, and in time I should have, I would have engineered a trumped-up escape myself. Oh, Peter, your head will roll into the fire, and you'll smell your hair burning before your brain knows you're dead. You'll burn as your father burned, and they'll give me a medal for it in the plaza. Did, for did you not murder your own father for the crown? You murdered him, Peter said. Flag laughed. <laughs> I? I? You've gone insane in the needle, my boy, Flag sobered. His eyes glittered. But suppose, just for an instant, suppose I did. Who would believe it? Peter still held the chain of the locket, looped over his right hand. Now he held that hand out in the hocket, the, sorry, the locket hung below it, swinging hypnotically, raying flashes of ruddy light on the wall. At the sight of it, Flag's eyes widened, and Peter thought, he recognizes it. By all the gods, he recognizes it. You killed my father, and, wasn't it the f and it wasn't the first time you arranged things in the same way. You had forgotten, hadn't you? I see it in your eyes. When Levin Valera stood in your way during the evil days of Alan II, his wife was found poisoned. Circumstances made Valera's guilt seem without question, as they made my guilt seem without question. Where did you find that, you little bastard? Flag whispered, and Naomi gasped. Pardon, you know, the, uh, the, word, the swear word there, if you will, uh, for the youth there. Uh, I'm just doing this unfiltered here at the end, so hopefully the parents can provide a little guidance if there's some younger folks listening. Yes, you forgot, Peter repeated. I think that sooner or later, things like you always begin to repeat themselves, because things like you know only a very few simple tricks. After a while, someone always sees through them. I think this is, what, this is all that saves us, ever. The locket hung and swung in the firelight. Who would care now, Peter asked. Who would believe? 
many. If they believed nothing else, they would believe you are as old as their hearts tell them you are. Monster, give it to me. You killed Eleanor Valera, and you killed my father. Yes, I brought him the wine, Flag said, his eyes blazing, and I laughed when his guts burned, and I laughed harder when you were taken up the stairs to the top of the needle. But those who hear me say so in this room will all soon be dead, and no one saw me bring the wine to these rooms. They only saw you. And then, from behind Peter, a new voice spoke. It was not strong, that voice. It was so low it could scarcely be heard, and it trembled. But it struck all of them, flag included, dumb with wonder. There was another who saw. Peter's brother, Thomas, said from the shadowed depths of his father's chair, I saw you, magician. Um, this is Peter holding the locket that he found up in the tower from Levin Valera over a couple hundred years ago, who was framed just by, just by Flag, just the same way. Here's Flag holding the executioner's axe with, uh, you heard in a previous chapter, his special adaptation of a couple of spiked balls tipped with poison at the top. All right. Chapter 140. Peter drew aside and made a half turn, the hand with the locket hanging from it still outstretched. Thomas, he tried to say, but he could not speak, so struck was he by wonder and horror at the changes in his brother. He had grown fat and somehow old. He had always looked more like Roland than Peter had, and now the resemblance was so great it was eerie. Thomas, he tried to say again, and realized why the bow and arrow were no longer in their places above the head of Niner. The bow was in Thomas's lap. The arrow was knocked in the gut string, ready to pull. It was then that Flag shrieked and threw himself forward, raising the great executioner's axe over his head. Should we end here? No, just kidding. Chapter 141. It was not a shriek of rage, but out of terror. Flag's white face was drawn. His hair stood on end. His mouth trembled loosely. Peter had been surprised by the resemblance, but he knew his brother. Flag, oh. Peter had been surprised by the resemblance, but, uh, but knew his brother. Flag was fooled completely by the flickering fire and the deep shadows cast by the wings of the chair in which Thomas sat. He forgot fe Peter. It was the figure in the chair he charged with his axe. He had killed, so now he thinks, it's, he thinks it's King Roland, if that's not obvious. He's, he thinks it's like the ghost of Roland. He had killed the old man once by poison, and yet here he was again, sitting in his smelly, mead-soaked robe, sitting with his bow and arrow in his hands, looking at Flag with haggard, accusing eyes. Ghost! Flag shrieked. Ghost or demon from hell, I care not! I killed you once, I can kill you again! I... Thomas had always excelled at archery. Although he rarely hunted, he had gone often to the archery ranges during the years of Peter's imprisonment, and, drunk or sober, he had his father's eye. He had a fine yew bow, but he had never drawn one like this. It was light and limber, and yet he felt an amazing strength in its lancewood bolt. It, had, it was a huge but graceful weapon, eight feet from end to end, and he did not have room to draw while fully sitting down, yet he pulled its 90-pound draw with no strain at all. Foe hammer was perhaps the greatest arrow ever made. Its bolt of sandalwood, its three feathers honed from the wing of an Anduin peregrine, that's like a falcon, its tip of flashed steel. It grew hot at the draw. He felt its heat bake his face like an open furnace. You told me only lies, magician, Thomas said softly. He released. The arrow flew from the bow, as it crossed the room, it passed directly through the center of Levin Valera's locket, which still dangled from the stunned Peter's outstretched fist. Ka ching The gold chain parted with a tiny chink sound. As I have told you, ever since that night in the North Forests, when he and the troop he had commanded had camped following their fruitless expedition in search of the exiles, Flag had been plagued by a dream he couldn't remember. He always awoke from it, with his hand pressed to his left eye, as if he had been wounded there. The eye would burn for minutes after he awoke, although he could find nothing wrong with it. Now the arrow of Roland, bearing the heart-shaped locket of Valera on its tip, 
flew across Roland's sitting room and plunged into that eye. Flag screamed. The two-bladed axe dropped from his hands, and the haft of that blood-soaked weapon shattered apart once and for all when it struck the floor. He staggered backward, one eye glaring at Thomas. The other had been replaced by a golden heart with Peter's blood drying at the tip. From around the edges of the heart, some stinking black fluid, it was most assuredly not blood, dribbled out. Flag shrieked again, dropped to his knees, and suddenly poof, was gone. Peter's eyes widened. Ben Stodd cried out. For a moment, Flag's clothes held his shape. For a moment, the arrow hung in the empty air with the pierced heart dangling from it. Then the clothes crumpled, and foe hammer clattered to the cobbles. Its steel tip was smoking. So it had smoked long ago when Roland pulled it from the dragon's throat. The heart glowed a dull red for a moment, forever after its shape was branded into the stones where it fell when the magician disappeared. What justice, what poetic justice, all that. Peter turned to his brother. Thomas's unearthly calm broke apart. No longer did he look like Roland. He looked like a scared and horribly tired little boy. Peter, I'm sorry, he said and began to cry. I'm sorrier than you will ever know. You'll kill me now, I guess, and I deserve to be killed. Yes, I know I do. But before you do, I'll tell you something. I've paid. Yes, I have. Paid and paid and paid. Now kill me if such is your pleasure. Thomas raised his throat and closed his eyes. Peter walked towards him. The others held their breath, their eyes wide and round. Gently, then, Peter pulled his brother from his father's chair and embraced him. Peter held his brother until the storm of his weeping had passed and told him that he loved him and would always love him. Then both wept, there below the dragon's head, with their father's bow at their feet, and at some point the others stole from the room and left the two brothers alone. Chapter 142 did they all live happily ever after? They did not. No one ever does, in spite of what the stories may say. They had their good days, as you do, and they had their bad days, and you know about those. They had their victories, as you do, and they had their defeats, and you know about those too. There were times when they felt ashamed of themselves, knowing that they had not done their best, and there were times when they knew they had stood where their God had meant them to stand. All I'm trying to say is, is that they lived as well as they could. Every, each and every one of them. Some lived longer than others, but all lived well and bravely. And I love them all, and I'm not ashamed of my love. I love this writing, this, this chapter, you know. It's not just a happily ever after thing. It's, it's very real, even though it's a fantasy story. Thomas and Peter, whoops, sorry about that. Thomas and Peter went to Delane's new judge general together, and Peter had, was taken back into custody. Remember, he's still technically, legally an escapee, you know, even though it was all a trumped-up thing from Flag that's got to go through process, too. His second stint as a prisoner of the kingdom was much shorter than the first, only two hours. It took Thomas 15 minutes to tell his tale, and the judge general, who had been appointed with Flag's approval, who was a timid little creature— took another hour and three quarters to verify that the terrible magician was really gone. Then all charges were overturned. That evening, all of them, Peter, Thomas, Ben, Naomi, Dennis, and even Frisky, met in Peter's old rooms. Peter poured wine all around, even giving Frisky some in a little dish. Only Thomas declined the vintage. Peter wanted Thomas to stay with him, but Thomas insisted, rightly, I think, that if he stayed, the citizens would tear him apart for what he had allowed to happen. You were only a child, Peter said, controlled by a powerful creature who terrified you. With a sad grin, Thomas replied, That is partly true, but people would not remember that, Pete. They'd remember Tommy Taxbringer and come for me. They'd tear through stone to get to me, I think. Flag's gone. But I'm here. My head is a silly thing, but I've decided I'd like to keep it on my shoulders a while longer. He paused, seemed to debate, and 
what then, then went on. And I'm best away. My hate and jealousy were like a fever. It's now gone, but after a few years of being in your shadow as you ruled, I might relapse. I've come to know myself a little bit, you see. Yes, a little bit. No, I must leave, Peter, and tonight. The sooner, the better. But where will you go? On a quest, Thomas said simply. To the south, I think. You may see me again, but you may not. I'll go south on a quest. I have many things on my conscience and much to atone for. What quest? Ben asked. To find Flag, Thomas replied. He's out there, somewhere, in this world or in some other. He's out there, I, I know it. I feel his poison in the wind. He got away from us at the last second. You all know it, and I do too. I will find him and kill him. I would avenge our father and make, my, make up for my own great sin. And I would go into the south first, for I sense him there. Peter said, But who will go with you? I, I can't. There's too much to do here. But I won't allow you just to go alone. He looked very concerned, and if you have seen a map of those days, you would have understood his expression. The south was nothing but a great white space on the maps. Unexplored, basically. Surprising all of them, Dennis said, I would go, my lord king. Both brothers looked towards him, surprised. Ben and Naomi also turned, and Frisky looked up from her wine, which she was lapping with cheerful, with cheerful enthusiasm. She liked the smell, which was cool, velvety purple. Not as good as the taste, but almost. That's sometimes how I feel about wine. Dennis blushed mightily, but he didn't sit down. You were always a good master, Thomas, and begging your pardon, King Peter, something inside me says you're my master still. And since I was the one that found the mouse and sent you to the needle, my king... Bosh, said Peter, that's all forgotten. Not by me it ain't, Dennis said stubbornly. You could say I was young, too, and didn't know better, but maybe I've my own mistakes to atone for. Here apparently is heading off on the quest, the friends seeing Thomas and Dennis off in their journey to find Flag in the south. Last page. He looked at Thomas shyly. I would come with you, Lord Thomas, if you would have me. I would be at your side in the quest. On the verge of tears, Thomas said, I will have you, you and welcome, good old... I, would ha I will have you and welcome, good old Dennis. I only hope you can cook better than I can. They left that very night, under the cover of darkness. Two figures on foot, their packs heavy with supply, wending their ways into the night. They looked back once and waved. That must be this picture here. Looking back and waving. All three of them waved back. Peter was weeping as if his heart would break indeed. He thought it might. I'll never see him again, Peter thought. Ah, oh, well, perhaps he did. Perhaps he didn't. But I rather think he did, you know. All I can tell you is that Ben and Naomi were eventually married. That Peter ruled long and well. And that Thomas and Dennis had many strange adventures. And that they did see Flag again and confronted him. But the hour is late. And all of that is another tale for another day. Here we are. There's the author, the guy who made it happen, Stephen King. I'm Nick Sal. I've been your dramatic reader. I hope you enjoyed my improvised accents and uh, uh, voice tone of the narrator and stuff like that. If you have any comments or feedback about my reading style, what I'm reading, please let me know. But as I said in the beginning, stick with me because we're going to read a number one bestseller that is also uh, came out when I was growing up and was read to me by teachers and stuff like that. I'm going to read it to you folks. It's still the number one young adult uh, selling book on Amazon right now. Gary Pulse and the Hatchet. I've got a couple other great books uh, like uh, His Majesty's Dragon, uh, which is another great fantasy uh, alternate history novel that I plan to put on deck. But again, thanks so much for reading with me. And we will continue to uh, read a couple more timeless classics for you for your enjoyment. Uh, for your children's enjoyment, for everybody, the, the young and the young at heart. All right, thanks again. 
and I really appreciate your support. Please subscribe.